today's video topic is the Kawasaki Versus 1100 SE. The reason, the update to Euro 5 Plus. The request from Versus 1000 owners is for an even more lively engine at low and mid RPMs and a slightly richer equipment package. So Kawasaki wants to respond with the new Versus 1100 here in the SC configuration. A motorcycle that, starting from the excellent foundation of the Versus 1000, a bike that I recall, reached the podium in our 2023 crossover comparison, if you haven't seen it, I'll put the link here, has evolved the project in a way that I would describe as well thought out. First of all, the engine, undoubtedly the main feature of the Versus renewal, the inline four with screamer timing, increases its displacement from 1043 to 1090 90 3 and importantly, it does so by increasing the stroke rather than the bore. Technical indication highlighting how Kawasaki has sought torque and a full delivery at medium low revs. The numbers after all speak for themselves. The torque increases from 102 to 112 nitros, and additionally, there are also 15 more horsepower, rising from 120 to 135. This result has been achieved with a revision of the engine that not only has a longer stroke, but also features increased flywheel masses, new camshafts, and intake runners tuned differently. In addition to all this, a new oil cooler has been added to better cool the engine oil. All the gear ratios have changed, and I say all because Kawasaki has intervened on both the longer primary gear and the shorter final transmission, which has effectively modified the ratios of the entire transmission, making them slightly longer overall. Additionally, the fifth and sixth gears are longer than in the past. The gear shift control is new, and the quick shifter now activates from 1500 RPM. The unchanged electronic package includes an electronic throttle with four engine mappings, one of which is fully customizable, along with traction control and cornering ABS. And what about the chassis? Well, there are no major changes there. The aluminum frame and the suspensions, which in the case of the SE are the excellent Showa and ARA are confirmed. The only thing to note is that the discs are no longer petal shaped with the rear diameter increasing from 250 to 260 millimeters. Almost as if Kawasaki had listened to my comment during the comparison, and wanted to accommodate me. The brakes are very effective at the front. The rear might deserve a little more power because there is quite a bit of weight here. However, I must say that overall, the Kawasaki Versus is a motorcycle that can comfortably compete for very high positions in the rankings. The Versus 1100S is 15,490 euros and the Versus 1100 SE is 17,590 euros. From an ergonomic and protection standpoint, the Versus 1100 does not differ from the Versus 1000, but Let's get on and explore it together. Here we are on the new Kawasaki Versus 1100. Let's see what it looks like when you're aboard. The Kawasaki crossover, new in a way, which comes from the 1000 and will feel familiar because the instrumentation has not been changed nor have the controls on the handlebars. As you know, this is the part that controls the riding mode and the preload of the suspension, cruise control, hazard lights, turn signals, and on the right, the select button to enter the various menus. We are in sport mapping. As you can see, the suspension setting at this moment is for rider plus luggage, a suspension setting that is configured for the motorcycle we are currently using. By holding down the preload button for a long time, you can change the preload of the motorcycle. As you can see, we have switched from two people plus luggage, or you can have the third option, which is one person without the bags. Please remember to always change the settings when you mount the bags because they weigh about 12 kilograms and are especially noticeable since they are mounted at the back. The instrumentation is a mix of analog and digital with an analog tachometer. I must say that the digital display is very clear, showing all the indications. Another setting option for the suspension is to enter the bike settings select vehicle settings and if we want to change the load compared to the base load that Kawasaki has provided for the three different settings 
solo, solo plus luggage or solo plus passenger, we select load adjustment and can further increase the preload by five steps or decrease the preload by another five steps. I return to the main menu because we still have other things to discuss. The mappings, as you know, can be changed using the left button by holding it down for a long time. Now we are in sport mapping. I go down to road mapping by holding uh, it down again and then to rain mapping. All of this can be done with the throttle closed while in motion. By holding it down for a long time, I go to rider mapping, which is the most interesting because you can customize everything that this motorcycle allows to be customized. So throttle, response, power F, traction control on three levels plus off, and the suspension set to hard. Within the suspension settings, you can all make fine adjustments. By holding down the select button, you enter rider mapping. As you can see, within this mapping, we can select everything we want to be adjusted. So with the back button, we return to the hard mapping. As you can see, we can adjust both rebound and compression for both the fork and the shock, allowing for very precise calibrations. Hold down the select button, and here we are in our more precise mapping, and I can go ahead and select. What I want to modify is that I can go plus or minus five. So here within the hard. Mapping provided by Kawasaki, we can vary both the front and rear in a very precise way. This level of adjustment is not so common among all the motorcycles present in this segment, making the rider mapping quite interesting. Other things to mention, the levers are both adjustable. The fairing is adjusted with the usual knobs here. I would say that perhaps a little more could have been done on this motorcycle, but let me know if you prefer instrumentation like this, a mixed digital and analog setup, because the analog tachometer still has its charm, which is why Kawasaki has kept it. Or do you prefer a fully digital instrument panel? This is everything you need to know about the Kawasaki. I add heated grips. Here's how they work. The first click activates them. And as you can see, the three lights are flashing, which means they are at maximum power. Another click lowers them by one power level and then they turn off. Now let's check the instrumentation. We're almost done with the test. We still have a bit of road to cover, but we can already draw some conclusions, especially since we know the motorcycle quite well. I will focus on the motorcycle's performance. I get on the bike and will show you a bit of the ergonomics, which I believe is very well centered. Kawasaki claims to have designed this motorcycle for riders 180 meters tall and above, so those who are tall will definitely find it comfortable. In reality, even I, who am 1.71 meters tall, can touch the ground well with both feet. Not with the whole foot, but with the tips. So let's say the support when stationary is optimal and I find the triangulation absolutely centered because it is a fairly dominant triangulation on the motorcycle, but not too relaxed and not too sporty either. In short, you can spend many hours in the saddle very comfortably. The seat, as I mentioned during the comparison, is generally firm in terms of padding. However, after many hours in the saddle, it is not tiring because its width allows for longitudinal movement. This entire area where the legs rest is very smooth and there are no uncomfortable contact points. From this perspective, I must say that Kawasaki has done an excellent job and there is also good wind protection. We know this because during the comparison, it scored the maximum points. The fairing could be adjusted differently, but I'll get to that later. It provides good coverage allowing you to ride with a modular helmet open without wind hitting your face and it covers your shoulders well. The only part that remains somewhat um, exposed is the forearm area where the hand guards are not able to deflect the airflow sufficiently. If there were a little more ear protection, those would also be included. But in terms of protection, we are almost at the level of a GT. In short, it could be, um, I'm not saying a competitor to an RT, but we are getting close. I move on to the engine, which is definitely the strong point. Of course, the question everyone is asking is, 
whether the work done on the inline four cylinder, increasing it to 1100, lengthening the stroke and the fly weights that have brought about these effects has been successful. I can tell you that it has, I tell you yes for two reasons. Now the motorcycle runs at much more relaxed RPMs than before. At 130 km h we are at 4600 RPM, which are RPMs typical of a twin cylinder, not a four cylinder. At 100 km h it's 4000 RPM. So let's say that the work on the gear ratios on the primary, fifth, sixth and final drive has effectively led to a much more relaxed fifth, sixth gear riding experience than before. But the engine is there, the power is there, especially from 4000 to 6000 RPM, but it is a hyper elastic engine. You can drop below 2000 RPM in sixth gear at 50 km h and it picks up without any problem. For those who are, let's say, obsessed with this issue and are very bothered by the chain hitting the swing arm, here nothing hits at all. There is an elasticity, a uh, creaminess in delivery that was already the strong point of the thousand and here there is even more with an engine that is a bit more present, especially in sport mode, from 4000 to 6000 RPM, it's right there there, ready at the throttle. The on-off is completely non-existent uh, in both road and sport maps. And I must say the delivery is nice. Uh, today I drove for many kilometers on some exceptional roads, by the way, guys, completely deserted around Barcelona. In fact, I'm keeping track because who knows, maybe we'll do an experience here in Spain. If you like it, let us know in the comments. However, I was always driving between 4,000 and 6,000 RPM with a delivery that was always ready and always present. Once you put it in sixth gear, if you want, you never take it out again because the pull that the engine has now is truly convincing. Perhaps it doesn't have the harshness of other inline four cylinder engines, but this creamy smooth thrust like an airplane taking off, just to give you an example, is very, very convincing. Among other things, the RPM on the highway ensures that there are virtually no vibrations when traveling at cruising speed. Very well. Vibrations occur when the engine is under load a bit in the tank area at very high frequency or when you are releasing above 6000 RPM but you are already traveling fast. Regarding the vibrations, I add that they appear at around 6000 RPM and disappear around 6500 RPM, which however is in that range just above 140. So we are seeing 150, 160, which are the indicated kilometers of the cruising speed that this motorcycle can achieve. And there the vibrations do come a bit on the seat, but it's really at those 500 RPMs at higher or lower revs. For example, if we are cruising at 130 or 135 or 140 km h, let's say we are in Germany. There are absolutely none. Then there's the upper part of the tachometer. The engine does rev up to 10,000, yes. But in my opinion, the beauty is so much in the lower range that pulling the gears at high revs won't be of much use to you. So in my opinion, the engine is uh, approved. The new gearing is also approved. The electronic controls are what we know. So they are of good quality, not um, excessive. The only thing I expected to improve was the transmission, not because it doesn't work well. The transmission works very well, especially with the quick shifter that activates at around 1500 RPM. So you can completely forget about the clutch. As soon as you start, the quick shifter uh, is already functioning. However, you may remember that I mentioned the control felt a bit, how can I say, spongy, a bit elastic. It has been slightly improved, but in uh, my opinion, it still feels a little elastic. And sometimes I find that if I downshift and tend to leave my foot a bit on the pedal, it doesn't engage the gear properly. It's not a problem with the transmission. I repeat, it's more about the linkage of the transmission, which might need to be adjusted differently to be a little uh, less spongy. Uh, in terms of equipment, the motorcycle is really well equipped. It has the entire electronic suite, semi-active suspensions that are also adjustable in detail, as you have seen. I have to say that if I had to add one thing, since there was an update to the model, perhaps for the SE version, they could have pushed it a little further by using the instrumentation from the Ninja H2SX, which is the nice big digital cluster, maybe with an integrated navigator. It's true that it has the mount for the phone on a bike like this, but having it inside would be nicer and the USB port mounted on the handlebar feels a bit out of place. It could have been better integrated into the dashboard or we could replace the 12 volt power outlet with the USB. There are some things that, in my opinion, could have been done on the SE, like installing an electrically adjustable windscreen, which however would have increased the weight, making it a true flagship because a motorcycle like this is indeed a flagship. Other things that could be changed in the evolution are the mapping change mode which currently occurs by pressing 
and holding the mode button. I would prefer a slightly quicker method like a single click on the mode button followed by um, a confirmation with another button to achieve a more immediate and faster mapping change. It must be said that at the price it is offered, which is just over 17,000 euros, with all this equipment, there is really very little to criticize, very little to complain about. I conclude with the chassis, which is a well-known chassis because not much has changed. Uh, the suspensions, in my opinion, work really well. Of course, when you start to pick up the pace, you need to switch to sport mapping. The road mapping keeps them quite relaxed, especially in terms of damping, both in rebound and compression. Of course, B, by using the rider map, we can customize all our mappings, soft, hard and medium, so we can create truly personalized mappings. However, I must say that if I travel relaxed, the road setting is fine as a response to the throttle, which remains quite responsive, but somewhat muted during the initial opening. If I start riding fast, it takes me about five minutes. I need to switch to the sport mapping, which tightens the suspension, but the suspension never becomes too stiff or makes you feel the bumps too much. The suspension always engages, but it keeps the Versus 1100 very flat, despite its considerable weight. It has a very flat bike and makes it handle really well, even in direction changes, taking impressive lean angles. I must say, today we reached 51 degrees. So for a touring motorcycle, let's say that it can handle some leaning, thanks to Kawasaki uh, for accommodating me. As I mentioned in the comparison that the rear disc needed to be a bit more effective. The rear disc is now uh, indeed more effective. I have to say that at this point, when it starts to push a bit, I would almost like the front brake to be a little more effective because it bites nicely. But if there were just a bit more bite, I wouldn't mind. One thing to note uh, is the original equipment tires, which I would have preferred to be a bit more modern with the model update because the T31s are honestly good on dry surfaces, but I'm not convinced by them on wet roads. The T32s are already available, but I remember when we tested the Versys with the Continental tires, it was a completely different story. The front end is very quick, but when it starts to lean in, I would like to have something more that does justice to the handling of the Versys, which is actually very good. In terms of suspension, I would say we are good. The motorcycle is, uh, in my opinion, well balanced between the front and rear. As I said, it always remains beautifully flat. It doesn't squat or dive when you accelerate or brake. And this ensures that the motorcycle with such a neutral setup is well balanced, allowing you to ride both slowly and fast safely and with great enjoyment. It is obvious that the engine is a four-cylinder inline. If you are looking for the character of twin-cylinder engines, it is not here. However, I must say that it is a four-cylinder inline that I like. The richness in the lower range is truly the best that this engine can express. And it showcases what a large displacement inline four-cylinder screamer with great torque can deliver. So from this perspective, well done, Kawasaki. Well, for the second point, we know that the seat is really very, very wide. The bags, as you know, are not standard, so they need to be purchased as an option. Personally, I would have included them as standard on the E6 because these bikes are always bought with the bags. I conclude with the consumption. The onboard computer indicated 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers, about 15.5 kilometers per liter, which I would say is quite consistent with what was recorded by the 1000 during our comparison, even though it was driven on completely different roads. So let's say we are close to what we had recorded with the $1,000. This is more or less everything I noted in my notebook here from Spain about the test of the new Versus 1100, which I find really convincing in terms of the engine. It can compete even with the higher power step. If you have any questions for me, I'm waiting for you down in the comments. You know that we always respond to everyone with the due calm. If you have any opinions you want to express down in the comments about the Versus 1100 SE, I'd say we'll see each other in the next video. Oh, please make sure to subscribe to the channel because we are now close to the very important milestone of 100,000 subscribers. And you know we will do some special things after reaching 100,000. I'm waiting for you down in the comments and we'll see each other in the next video.